Hello and welcome to episode 10 of IGN Overclocked. This is our PC show. My name is Mitch Dyer. I am one of your hosts. Joined mostly as always by Dan Stapleton. I am mostly as always Dan Stapleton. I think Stapleton. you've actually done more episodes than me. I don't know why I'm <laughs> saying mostly. I feel like you missed one and I was like, we're never going to see Dan again. I missed like, I was out for like three weeks. Although I guess we, we took a couple breaks there. I yeah, think. I mean, we missed a couple episodes in there and then I went to Japan and you took over. You were giving birth, right? That's what yeah, so that, that, yeah. That's, that's what happened to me. Yeah. Okay. So you gave birth. Jared Petty. Hi. First time on the show? Uh, no, second. Uh, actually, it. I've been here before. So. I think you are probably on a Dan episode. Yep. Uh, I was on a Dan episode. Yes, you were. That's was. right. All uh, these things that I missed. Well, yeah. welcome back. Thank you Thank for you. joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. I'm really excited to be here because computers are fun. Yeah, the personal computer is a pretty good gaming device. That is. Uh, this episode is going up Friday. Sounds right. So I did not write this down on the show notes. Real quick improv. Has anyone tinkered with the Steam controller yet? I did. Okay. Quick thoughts on the Steam controller. I, I, I like it. Uh, it's, it's weirdly good. Yeah, I mean, the the it you know feels a little bit different, which is kind of the idea. Uh, so it's going to take some getting used to, but uh, but I, I already find it more precise than than uh, gamepad for aiming. Yeah, uh, wow, which is which is nice. Um, one of my big problems with playing with a gamepad is I just cannot aim. And this is obviously not going to be as good as a mouse and keyboard ever, but it's still like better in terms of you know fine control over yeah, exactly yeah. where the where the gun is aimed i was playing a little bit of uh, half-life 2 episode 2 which is not at least the pc version does not have game uh, gamepad support what yeah so i so i plugged Man. it in get it together for help <laughs> <laughs> well they don't need to because now they got the no, of this, course yeah. Ah, there we go yeah so i plugged it in and i, I kind of didn't realize it didn't have gamepad support but i plugged it in and like it's like oh you have to configure your own controls for this uh, so it's like okay, I, and I jumped in there, and it makes it really easy. You just push the the you know the jewel button in the middle, uh, and it pops up with you know things saying want to configure your controls, and it's got a very easy way to remap your controls. Um, it's like keyboard bindings where it's like, yeah, what exactly. do you want right trigger to do? And exactly. You're like, okay, right trigger, shoot, pull. Okay, cool. So got they it. know their audience. They know you like to have customization yeah. power of your controls. Well, and it right. registers yeah. as a CMOS controller, obviously, but I think it. It doesn't treat it like a gamepad. It treats it like a mouse and keyboard. Well, so there are different options. You can have it behave just like a gamepad, oh, cool. or you can switch it to a mouse and keyboard emulation. There's a bunch of different options in there. Yeah, so, that's my favorite thing about it is how yeah. customizable and flexible it is and how it's just kind of liquid, right? Like, people can make custom control schemes and make yeah. it available for download. It's like, yep. okay, the controls in this game are complicated, but here's a really good scheme that somebody's made. You can just right. install it on the controller. So one of my favorite things about it was uh, the, the buttons under the, the, uh, the handles. The grips, I yeah, think they're called. The grip, the yeah. grip buttons. Yeah. RG and LG. Right. So I, I was using those for jump and crouch. It's like oh that. My God. That was surprising. You're one of natural. those people. Yeah. Well, I'm just, interesting. I'm experimenting. See how that works. Underneath yeah. there. Okay. Um, you know, it's it's better than like pushing in a, a yeah, I totally joystick, agree. God. which don't exist. Yeah. Well, there, there is one. There's the one, but yeah, there's, there's no one click one. on it. Uh, I forget if there is or not. I, I thought I there was. Yeah. Know, while we're wrong. on this, actually, the, the, the touchpad click. Yes. I haven't used this thing since the very, very early prototype ages ago. What's what's changed? What is what is it like now? There's a there's a thumbstick now. Okay. That's that's the big difference. Also, there's no touchscreen, uh, like or you know. Yeah. LCD on it at all like there used to be. Oh god, the, yeah. those those are the biggest changes. And there's still that weird tactile double pad thing. Yes, down yes, there? Okay. and it feels really good, right? Like the mouse pad trackpad thing on your thumb. Yep, super responsive, and you can change it. You can, like you can sensitivity. Also, you can also adjust the haptic feedback, which I love. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. so good. I love the like that that small rumble underneath, like just yeah. a little vibration yep. under your thumb, so you know exactly yeah, where I, you are. I really like the early ones. Yeah. So this is exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can also yeah like the the left. Um, uh, touchpad also has a uh, kind of a uh, cross indentation on it that makes it feel more like a D-pad. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's probably not going to be as precise as a D-pad for like a platformer, but it'll probably be very good. I haven't tried a platformer yet. Yeah, I was wondering Although, how like Mega Man Anniversary yeah. or something would feel eventually with well, that. Well, I mean, Vince <laughs> jumped on and, and played a little bit of uh, a little bit of Super Meat Boy and was doing great. Yeah, I played oh, okay. Super Meat Boy as well. Yeah. Feels really good. Yeah, so uh, for, maybe for platformers, it'll yeah. be just as good. Who knows? I think my only issue so far is I love the way it feels in my hands, which is weird because I don't I initially really hated like the inverted handles like mm. it just looks weird and it felt wrong but now I'm like way into it but my issue is when I'm using the when I'm playing it more traditional style like I have left hand on the thumbstick and the right hand on the face buttons like when I'm the face me, buttons like, are weirdly positioned they're weird they're so weirdly positioned that I would constantly go to hit I think A and I would hit B mm. because yeah, just like the spacing I'm used to on every other gamepad is such that I would always hit the wrong button without looking. Yep. So, so like the the bottom most button is so far over to the left that you hit the rightmost button when you're trying to hit the bottom most button. Yeah, I was oh, right. Wow. I did. Yeah. Good. That's a much better explanation than did mine. Did you start adapting over time? No, or you I still haven't figured it out. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't I'm used sure it very will. long yet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very fresh in our minds. Well, yeah. here, here's the burning question for me. Um, 
if I, you know, I have a living room set up for my PC, mm -hmm. uh, and so if I want to sit back and play Civ Five with this controller, oh, I'm absolutely, be able to yeah, yeah. absolutely, that would work. Honestly, that, I feel like that kind of stuff works better than your your high responsive kind of thing. Like I wouldn't want to play Counter Strike with this. I would prefer mouse and keyboard just because oh, yeah. it is so highly competitive and skill-based that you need that. Mm -hmm. And it's nice that the controller is an option, and it's fine on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, but it is made for mouse and keyboard. But, Jared, let me, let me tell you the problem with, with Civ Five in that situation. It's not controls. Controls are fine. Uh, it's reading the text on the screen. Oh, yeah, that, that distance. Yeah. That's right. Like the, the text oh, on, like on a television? Yeah. And the, the text on, on, a, on a lot of these games that are designed for mouse and keyboard yeah. are designed to be played on a, on a PC monitor up close and personal. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Right. That's so that, interesting. That, that's a, a significant hurdle to playing. You know, I, It's like, I want to play anything on there. It's like, yeah, well, only if you don't want to. Some things are not going to work. Well, I mean, that's part of, what, part of what I love about PC gaming is that intimacy. You know, it's the same thing I enjoy about handheld gaming. You're just right there with it, and that's always been a part of it, kind of leaning in. But... Since I've done the living room set up and experimented, I've been surprised how much I've had fun with certain things. But yeah, that that does not yeah. be able to see from there. I've never even tried playing Civ that way yeah. because the controls would be so awkward. So I think like... the launch stuff, or at least the way it works now, is like there's honestly not a lot of great games that support the controller or SteamOS. Well, and the, the thing about the controller is not you don't have to support the controller because the controller it emulates a mouse. And sure, keyboard. yeah, yeah. Um, but that'll be a problem on like if you get a Steam box, right? Like you can you need the Linux stuff, but does the controller necessitate SteamOS? Like, could I pair that with my current setup on Big Picture, at home on my yeah, PC, absolutely. Like Windows PC? Yeah, I was I was playing it on Ooh, a Windows PC. That is really appealing. Okay. Yeah, That's really, cool. really, really appealing to me. Even though, like, I think the controller is good. I don't love it. I think it's got problems. I think it's a little bit too lightweight. It feels like I want to break it in half half mm -hmm. the time. But some of those features are really good. And I, if like the combination of controller and Steam Link on my Windows PC is mm -hmm. super sexy. Yep. Definitely want that setup. Not convinced I need to buy a Steam machine. Yeah, well, you already have a PC. A Steam yeah. machine is not is not for you. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's for somebody who who either doesn't own a PC at all or wants yeah. to buy a new PC and wants something hassle free they can plug into. That's why I'm so glad Link exists because it if Link didn't exist that would be so dirty. Because well, the Zelda would, games wouldn't be very good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good. No point. No one would rescue the princess. Very good point. Yeah, uh, that, that would be pretty problematic. Yes. But you would end up having to buy a PC, like or sorry, a Steam machine to use this thing. But in your living room, if mm. con like most people don't have their PCs in their living rooms, like I bring mine out. Jared's got a good setup for that, but yeah. most people just don't have their PCs ready in their living room, ready to go to play PC games on their TV. So the Link is like the perfect solution for me. Yep, and a lot of people I expect. And the thing with the the Steam Link is they they strongly recommend a wired connection, and for obvious reasons. Oh yeah, because I mean you can do it over Wi-Fi, but you can't. obviously the latency, the latency would be an issue, especially yeah. if you're playing something competitive like Counter Strike. Right. Yeah, you probably don't want to do that. I played a game of Dota 2 with the controller, like online against other humans. And the, the line that Valve has always used for that is like, yeah, you can do it. You won't win, but you or can do it. Or will you? <laughs> Find out on IGN. I made a video about it. Uh, I, I went in and I was like, I'm going to play a game. I'm going to play as Lena. I'm going to use just the, the gamepad, no keyboard, not even to chat with anybody. I want to win. And mm -hmm. I played a game and I wanted to win so badly. So we made a video about it. I want to see. Maybe you guys have an honor system pad handicap league or something. Yeah, you know, I, just... I was thinking about that. Like, I want to get a pro in the office or something and play 1v1, and they use a controller, and I use a mouse keyboard, and can I beat them? Yep. No, you can't. Probably. No, probably not. <laughs> cool. Uh, you probably couldn't beat them on, on mouse and keyboard. Yeah. yeah. Oh. We'll have a lot more thoughts on this as time goes on. Obviously, yep. like, as more games become compatible and we spend more time with the controller and as the hardware starts coming in. But for now, it's like... This is, all seems pretty good, and I'm yeah. excited to try out more of it and spend more time with it, even though I don't think the controller is going to replace a mouse and keyboard. It's a nice alternative in some yeah. cases. No, it's, it's, yeah. it's for where a mouse and keyboard cannot go. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not something that you're going to pick up instead of a keyboard when, right. when you, and a mouse and keyboard when you can't have that. Yes. Cool. Uh, Jared, you've been playing a game that I am excited to learn more about. I have not played a ton of this, mm -hmm. which is to say I played zero. Uh, <laughs> I just keep hearing a lot about it, and it makes me want to play it, but it sounds so strange and sort of overwhelming in some ways where it's just like the most stressful game, Undertale. No, it, I, it, okay, there's people are talking about about what, what's hidden in Undertale, but just sitting down and playing Undertale is the easiest thing in the world. It's super self-explanatory. I mean, it's it's fundamentally a, a turn-based RPG with some neat twists and some really cool under under the table mechanics that affect the storytelling uh it, it looks like if, if earthbound and megaton had a baby and uh and then that baby got flushed through ms paint 
hmm. uh, you would have Undertale, I, which is, according to its, its designer, apparently the art was done in paint, uh, the design and game maker largely. Sounds about right. Yeah, it's fun. It's a, uh, it's a neat, whimsical, dark, happy, and really funny classic style RPG with a lot of clever puzzles and plot twists. But what's really getting people talking about Undertale is that Undertale watches and Undertale remembers. If you alter things in the game, your actions, your every action, often the most innocuous actions, end up having repercussions. And those repercussions extend into your playthrough. But if you do things like, say, go back and start a new game, Undertale still knows. Hmm. And the choices you made in one place in some situations affect what you did in other places. That's the part that's gotten people talking. Now, there's also a lot of really innovative stuff in it. It's, it's adorable. Like I said, it is laugh out loud funny. So what, what's something that, that like I can do in one game that if I say, oh, I messed up and I want to go start another game, uh, what what is something that would carry over? Here's I'm glad you asked. So without, anybody without listening to this, anything. put put the well, I'm, I am going to spoil. I, I think the best illustration is a spoiler. So listeners, watchers, next 90 seconds, if you don't want to know, I'm gonna. I cleared this with Mitch before the show. <laughs> so there's a genocidal path you can take through the game where you kill everything in the world, and if you do this path, um, you can apparently at the end you can team up with the bad guy and mm. help destroy the world. Cool. You destroy the universe. You're like, okay, I got that ending. So you go back to start the game because there's multiple endings. You want to play again and try something different, and you start the game up, and there's a black screen and the sound of wind. Because the universe has been you destroyed the universe. Right. <laughs> and so it's just they're gone. And if you sit and wait for 10 minutes, a menu pops up. And it's like, hey, if you really want to play again, you can, but it'll cost you your soul. <laughs> and if you agree, then you start another game. But that affects the next playthrough, too, because you don't have a soul anymore. And it's just that kind of stuff. But there's also all these littler examples. You can So, spoiler territory over. Back to the safety all right, all again. Right. Um, We're safe. Yeah, there's neat stuff. We're back to safety. You can listen again. Spoiler over. Then other neat little things there, like you don't have to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. You can go through the game making friends with or negotiating with all the enemies you encounter, and you can find ways to make that work, and they're kind of logical ways. The combat system, there's a little heart at the bottom of the screen in a standard RPG battle window, and you're effectively doing bullet hell shooter dodges against little patterns coming in with your controls, and if you evade everything, you dodge the attack or you succeed. It's just really innovative and a little different than anything else I've ever played. It's one of those games that, as you describe it, I'm like, ha literally, how does this exist? Yeah, it's It is great. so weird. Like, obviously, nobody would ever publish this. Obviously, this is, like, one of those gem of an indie game that yeah. you, you'll really only ever see on PC. It reminds me of, uh, if you've ever played Space Funeral? I have not. Okay, so Space Funeral was this, I think it was actually made an RPG maker, of all things, a few years ago. And it was just kind of weird, like, if Acid Jazz were a role-playing game, it would be Space Funeral. It, it didn't make any sense, and it wasn't all that well-balanced, but it was hilarious. This is like a really fleshed-out, thought-out version of Space Funeral. It has problems. It has a lot of problems, frankly. But the joy, the mirth, and the innovation far exceeds the criticisms I would have of the game. This is, this is a really solid game that people should play. That's all? That's you? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I can say standard. about that game. Yeah. And where can they play it? Uh, they can play this game on the PC. It's on Steam uh, Greenlight, and you can also... Okay, because what you described sounds like an Itch.io game. <laughs> like, well, this, no, yeah, it's, it's, it's on Greenlight. Uh, I grabbed my copy through Steam. It's on the Steam. The, the Steam. Steam. Yeah. So. Cool. Uh, yeah, I really love when games do that. It's like the Resetti the Mole thing and Animal Crossing to a weirder, more messed up degree, where it's, mm -hmm. it's aware of everything you're doing, and I think... I would love to see more of that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and beyond the gimmick. Beyond, and that's not just a gimmick. I mean, the save file stuff's really cool. Having a choice that makes it matter. But just just a straight play through where you never caught on to the fact that any of this was yeah, going yeah, on yeah. is still great. Now you've ruined things. it for everybody by telling us all the stuff that happened. No, just <laughs> that one thing. So, How yeah. long is it? There's a lot of stuff that happens. but There's a lot. I... I no answer. I, okay. I honestly don't know. A vague multiple yeah, hours. A, a vague, I've, a vague amount of time. I've heard it, it's not super long. No. Well, again, but it it encourages multiple playthroughs, so mm -hmm. that's that's why I'm having trouble mm -hmm. giving a, a straight answer on this. I don't. Right. Okay. Sorry. Fair enough. Check that out. Game seems awesome. It's neat. Jared, you also played. Underworld Ascendant. Well, actually, I, I want to be clear. I saw a demonstration okay. of Underworld you Ascendant. You were near Underworld Ascendant. I was in the presence of Underworld Ascendant, and I talked with some of the people who are making the game. So this is the Ultima game that can't be called Ultima. Right. Um, yeah, you guys... Because EA owns it. Right. Did you guys play Ultima Underworld? No. I did not. Okay, so Underworld is... Think like proto Deus Ex. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just this. People were like, "Hey, we have these first-person RPGs." We're going, eh, 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 
three right. corridors. Like 90 degree turns. Yeah. And single and, frame and images. And at the same time, first person shooters were kind of, and they're like, what if we had a world where you could just walk around and do stuff really early on? And it was innovative, and it was the great, great granddaddy of what became, you know, like Skyrim or Deus Ex or things like that. Uh, the puzzle solving, combat, uh, interactive environments where you could do all kinds of neat, fun, emergent things. And it was all set in the Stygian Abyss, and now the, the guys that helped put this together have gotten back and they got the band back together, or at least some of it, and they're building. So this was a, a Kickstarter game. thing. Kickstarter succeeded. However, yeah. long, however many months it's been, like there's a video game now. Yeah, there, there's, there's a slice of a video game. There's, yeah, a, there, of, of they course. were very transparent about the fact that this is a work in progress. But they've got some of the systems working now. They wanted to show, so they've, they've upgraded the visuals. They have been crystal clear about the fact that they know they can't compete with, with what people expect from a AAA game. They're not even going to try. So they're just going to try to make it look clean and, and passable and, and not an affront to the eyes and create something that looks good. I hope that the the kind of offsetting thing with that is like, okay, we can't make AAA quality high fidelity, so let's do something interesting with the art. Uh, that, yeah, I and I think that the little slice that I saw was, it was it sure was art. It worked. <laughs> it was uh, art. You know? Yeah, okay. I mean, it, it didn't. Look, it was it was not offensive to the eyes at all. It was just it was functional. Yeah. Uh, and and when when where people run into trouble with that is trying to make like realistic looking graphics. Yeah. But they. You know, just don't have the 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 resources to do it, so it yeah, ends up yeah. looking like something from 15 years ago. Yeah. Right. There was a big pillar of fire, and I'm like, hey, look, a big pillar of fire. It's kind of cartoony right. and kind of, and it works. Right. The, um, the cartooniness is what what helps. Yeah, that yeah. works for me. But what they are working on is, you know, the, the two strengths of that kind of game that they think they can really innovate on. One is, you know, with a player authored situation where you're in an area full of lore and full of inhabitants and things you can interact with, but how you choose to interact with those systems really defines how your adventure goes. You're telling your own story. That that uh, again, that Skyrimy kind of thing. So I was like, going to ask, like, yeah. obviously, it's not a big AAA game. It's not a Bethesda game that they spent six years making. Yeah. So it's not going to be the same quality. But how does it compare to its sort of contemporaries that Ultima inspired, like Deus Ex and? Skyrim and those kinds of games like how the, does Ascendant compare to those the little slice that I saw I can't give you I can't give you a definitive answer of what's going to happen I think they're moving in the right direction that what they were showing off was kind of a proof of concept where they said hey look there's you and you turn this light off and there's a shadow beast and now you're going through the dungeon the shadow beast is cha chasing you and shadow beast doesn't like light so it evades or puts out light sources. You can use environmental things. It has you using traps against it and, and having flowing rivers of lava that you're using light yep. sources yep. from to move it around. But these are all independent <laughs> systems. It's not a scripted environment. It's just a bunch of stuff laid around that all happens to interact in unpredictable ways. And you and the AI are kind of facing off in that constantly. In that scenario that we saw, there was no combat. We were, uh, they, they, were playing a, they were playing a thief with some magic skills and it, there was no fighting at all. They're like, yeah, if you were a fighter, you just walk in, bang, 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 kill the shadow beast. Like, but in this situation, using a combination of spell knowledge and a stealth innovation That's more to interesting lead it to me through stuff. Brute and, force. Right, and it was just stuff that was happened to be laid around. So they're like, the idea is we're going to have this whole giant lore-filled Stygian Abyss with a really neat immersive story, and then you're going to be able to play with it. So uh, if I've, I've never played an Ultima game in my entire oh, life. Wow. Not wow. once. I'm like vaguely aware of what they are and the people behind it like if i've never been into that is that something that's going to appeal to someone like me who's maybe i guess like a younger pc gamer uh, i think so if you like nerd lore yeah yeah if you like nerd lore ultima is your land um it's basically a digital dnd handbook it is uh it, but it, I, I like ultima's lore more than most of the sure, indies yeah. uh and also underworld and the ultima universe are they're a little different. The Stygian is, it's the kind of place where you're just like, I want to read compendiums. If you read role-playing books for fun and never play the game, these are the games for okay. you. Uh, yeah, it's, but yeah, uh, what brings Ultima fun? It's always been kind of innovative and neat and tried new things, and it's been very unapologetically, like, uber nerdy. And I, I'm excited about that idea because uh, these guys were talking in glowing terms about the, the the relationships between the underworld civilizations and how each is, you know, that, that you are speaking my language. Uh, sign me up. I love that stuff. Um, if you're more, if you're just wanting to hop in and hack at things, um, I don't know. Um, I'd give it a try. Knowing you, Mitch, I think you'd go for it. Dan, I, okay. I don't know. What about you? Is that appealing to you? I, I enjoy that style of game. I'm, I'm much more of a sci-fi setting than, than fantasy yeah, guy. Yeah, that, that's that's, I never played an Ultimate game either because I was, I'm much more into sci-fi RPGs. Um, I, I play 
some of them, but I've, I've like I never actually finished a Dragon Age. Whereas the really, whereas the Mass Effect okay. games, I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'm all about those. Um, and you know, Fallout versus like Torment, I was all about Fallout. So I I uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd be into it, but I, I do really like the the systems based stuff uh, where you can toy with the environment. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about about like even something like Bioshock, you know, where you you just make maximize the use of things in the environment to uh, to mess up bad guys. Like it's it's much a much more interesting form of combat. Yeah, there seem to be a lot of multiple approaches uh, that were going to be possible in interactions with with different AI actors that would cause different interesting stuff to happen. And also, I, I talked about the the lore in the other end of, of Ultima. Is it has also been very innovative. Ultima three is the prototype for party based video game setup. Four, yeah, four guys like... in a party doing or yeah. say, you know, uh, Ultima four. Uh, that that game is amazing. You don't even know what your goal is when you started. Like <laughs> you're you're just a guy, and it gives Sound you a like fort- Skyrim. Have you, you, they give you a fortune telling test, oh, and they ask you a bunch yeah. of like these these morality questions. They're like, okay, so in this moral dilemma, what do you choose? You finish that, it assigns you a class based on those decisions. Drops you in the world, and Lord British is like, yeah, the giant crisis is over, but since the giant crisis is over, nobody really knows what to do anymore. So go inspire the land. And that's the start of the game. All right. Uh, and Whatever did, you yeah. say, Lord British. So uh, Underworld, did, you know, it, it innovated in creating some of these things that have now become very common in, in, in games like what, what we see with Bethesda. I think what these guys are trying to do is, is harken back to, to those roots and try to create something that exists between the, the, the expanse of Skyrim that's got a little maybe more constrained tightness to the environment where you can play around with these tricks and traps more. And I think that's cool. Fun. And Richard Gar- Garriott is not involved in this, right? No, Underworld was, was always... That thing, was kind right. of an off... It, Underworld was a offshoot of Ultima. It was right. it was, it was a side series. Uh, yep. Ultima Gaiden. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so 1 and 2 both were, were great games. Um, and yeah, I think it's neat. But I, I'd also, you know, I'm I don't want to overhype. You know, I saw a slice, so yeah. there's when, a long way to go. When is it going to be playable? Uh, I what that that slice was playable. When I'm I don't th- they're not projecting a playable game for a while yet. They're yeah. a, a full large. You know, it'll be a bit yeah. before we see that. That's something to keep an eye out for. Yeah, out there on the horizon. Uh, I think this is a long term thing. Do we have any video of it up on the site? That people yeah, we do. Uh, people yeah. go along with uh, some developer commentary of what's going on. Nice. Yeah. Actually, uh, by the time this goes up, there will also be a little written thing by me. Oh, go cool. Go so. find that. Go find Jared's name on a cool little article thing. Yeah. Boys, this week we saw the weirdest Half-Life leak I think I've ever seen. <laughs> um, and normally, like, when it came in, I dismissed it as, like, there's no way. Like, we are not reporting on this. We're not reporting on HL3.txt file. <laughs> not doing it. This is garbage. Until I realized, like, oh, this is... Something that was pushed to Dota 2 by Valve, for sure. This is something that exists somewhere inside Valve. And it's the strangest thing. Damn, what did you make of this leak or whatever you want to call it? I mean, it, in, in a lot of ways, it's completely unsurprising to me. It's like, yes, we know that the Valve has you know tinkered with Half-Life 3 at various points. When yeah. We're fairly sure they've they've started and stopped and restarted and, and you know, it's almost... Almost like a Duke Nukem scenario at this point, where where they just you know have probably iterated on it multiple times, um, without ever finding something they really like, uh, they like enough to to put out and you know put the Half Life name on. Um, so it's like yeah, there's going to be files floating around called Half Life whatever, and you know that they did a lot of that stuff on Source Two, I'm sure. So Source Two is going to contain <clears throat> some little little tidbits of, the, of Half Life. So. I- it's not. It's not. It wasn't to me a, a big shocking thing. I can't remember who in the office asked. Uh, I said, you know, what are we going to joke about when Half Life Three is finally confirmed? And they immediately said Half Life Four confirmed. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's that's adorable. Yeah, uh, you know, we, we get this little bit. It looks like I sat down with one of our engineers, and it looks like it's a piece of a dev tool. Yeah. Um, probably used for multiple projects. And yep. there are little references to Half-Life things in there, but there's also references to the Xbox. You know, So we know this thing's been built on for a long... Or the Xbox 360, pardon me. So we know it's been built on a long time. What I'm more excited about here is is thinking about... Yeah, we know they've worked on it. We know they might still be working on it. It's been so long. And it got me thinking about how when Half-Life 2 launched, it really kind of subverted a lot of our expectations of what that was going to be. You know, we, we appear in a world that's very different from the world at the end of Half-Life 1. We get it boxed with Portal, something we never thought we'd get at all. How would Half-Life 3 surprise us now? Like, if Half-Life 3 were revealed, instead of just taking off where Episode 2 let it off, would they even bother anymore to tell that part of the story? Or do you jump and do something completely different? You like can't end before? Episode 2 the way you do. 
and not address that in any capacity. Well, I don't say not address, it but what if it happens a... in the aftermath of that as yeah. opposed to what it happens? Sure, and like I don't think it's going to be like, okay, they stand up and they continue right from there. Like yeah. I think it's going to be very different. Whatever it is, like, because it must have changed. Whatever Half-Life 3 is must have changed. This amount of time, like, do you just go straight back to what you were doing or do you try to innovate and do interesting new things? I, I expect that what they would do if if they ever decide yes we're going to put out Half Life Three, which I'm not convinced they have. I am the same way. I don't but, think that game is ever coming out. But if they ever decide they're going to do that, uh, I think they're going to make a short Half Life Two Episode Three that bridges the gap. Um, okay. Oh really? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think they they would probably wrap up that story and then uh, Half Life Three itself the new one. would be a different thing. Right. So like, I, with I think, whatever portal connections they've been setting up, if if they decide that's a good idea, yeah. So yeah, I think I ju- I would not make an episode three. I would jump maybe years ahead mm-hmm. from that point uh, and start I, in a Gord- maybe even a Gordonless story that that just goes off, takes you know drops the co- crowbar Jesus mantle and picks up with people maybe we've never met before. I, I don't think tied you, into this world. And I maybe, don't think you can have Half Life without Gordon Freeman. Do you know? That classic, memorable character, Gordon Freeman. I, I feel like I, I'd be great without him. I, I, I mean, I love Gordon. I, I don't want to besmirch him, but, I mean, just, just jumping off in a whole new direction. Not I'm not saying ridening it. Don't, like, fool us. Yeah. Don't put Gordon on the box. Just, you know, give me that Lambda and, and jump right yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, you and I were talking earlier about, like, what if there was a Half-Life game without Gordon? And I think that, to Dan's point, you do need Gordon involved. And I would love if Gordon became, like, an Alex kind of character, where mm. if he was your mentor, like, if you were... Uh, like in the rebellion and a student of his or like his protege or something like that, right? Like some connection to Gordon working with him. Then you can personify that guy. Mm -hmm. You can have like a faceless, voiceless protagonist interacting with this person in this world. I I don't, I don't see the point, honestly. Like Gordon is like the ultimate blank slate. He, he is Mm -hmm. like, he is the, the vessel for us to inhabit. Like that's why he's mute. That's why he doesn't have, you know, any, any real, personality except what we have kind of assigned to him there's no reason to replace that because he's he is the you know kind of the ideal uh person for us to inhabit in, yeah. in a oh, game I, but you can I, assign I, anything you want to gordon freeman it doesn't change the fact that nobody in the game responds to him right but yeah. I, I mean i'm saying like if if they were to like let's say they got rid of gordon freeman they would just have us inhabit someone else and sure. not, not have that character say anything so but why we, get rid of gordon well gordon because freeman? because of the way people react to gordon i mean the crowbar jesus factor you know, at this point, has has kind of reached an epic scale. I feel like Gordon's got almost a almost a theological Santa Claus bag on his shoulder now to carry around. Right, and, but, and but they could they could change the setting and keep, they could keep like keep, take him away from that. Well, let's talk about changing the setting because that's that's another part I've wondered about. I mean, would this have to be a scripted? 3D adventure game at this point, or, or could they take a different design approach? I mean, so people freaked out a little bit because there was stuff in that text file that obviously indicated creating things for, say, quest structures mm-hmm. uh, or parties and open world possibilities. Could you approach the design of Half Life Three in a radically different way? Than of the course, first game? Oh, yeah, I think they absolutely would. would. Yeah. yeah. How would they do it? What, what would you look for? I mean, well, my. I was actually surprised recently that that uh, Eric Wolpaw confirmed that it was not being developed as a as a VR game. With with Valve's uh, preoccupation with VR in the last few years, I was I was kind of convinced that uh, they were going to do basically what they did with Half Life One and Two and and establish this is how you make this kind of game. Yes. Uh, with Half Life One, they they said, okay, this is how you tell a story in a first person shooter. With Half Life Two, they said, okay, this is how you do physics puzzles. Um, and physics manipulation of the environment. Uh, I expected them to say, "Okay, Half Life Three. This is how you do how you do a VR game." Um, you know, using all of their expertise to kind of set that that standard. I wouldn't um, doubt that it has VR compatibility. Like the fan the fantasy version of the future where Half Life Three exists. I would imagine that game is that to a certain degree. I'm not sure it is. But I mean, based on based on what what uh, I've seen, what, like Chet Falzak yeah. say uh, about just like you, like he's. He's tweeted about how you like you can't just slap a, a first-person shooter into VR and expect a good experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that Valve would do like something that can be played in, in VR or maybe not. Yeah. Uh, because the the way you interact with the world and and you know Valve is super super into VR these days. The way you interact with a VR world is completely different from the way you interact with a with a non-VR world. If, if yes. you're if you're trying to do what Valve does, which is uh, try to do it the best way you can. Like they're they're completely fixated on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, establishing a sense of presence. And you right, just... and they did very very well with that with both the Portal and the Dota 2 demos in the HTC Vive demos they made. Right, those are very much about 
sort of passive soaking in of the environment. And yes, you can engage and mm -hmm. tinker with stuff, but it's not about that. There, It's about Valve creating a space that feels as real as a digital space could possibly feel and populating with stuff that you want to learn more about. And the the style of gameplay that would that would exist in that kind of environment is completely different from what would exist in a traditional first person shooter. So, so we're thinking about so. something investigative, an open world type setting perhaps? Ooh, that sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's it could be anything really. I, I I hesitate to predict what Valve might do, but but open yeah. open world using Valve's uh, lighthouse technology doesn't seem very plausible, just because no. uh, it, it's it, it'd be more of a locked room is an issue. Yeah, locked more room. more of a locked room scenario. Well, the way say. that uh, Epic is doing it with Bullet Train and uh, I feel bad Star Seed. I think it's called Star Seed. It's an episodic PC game coming, and it's a it's a Vive game, or it's a game that works or is made for the headset. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way that works is you point your controller somewhere and using whatever input they have, you create a like a wireframe box mm -hmm. and then you say go and it just teleports you there. Mm. And that's what Bullet Train does it too. It's like I want to go there and it just teleports you there. Mm. And now in that space you've allowed yourself to move to, you can engage with stuff in that very confined area. Right. And that's how they get around navigation. Which is it still still seems weird to me. Yeah, it doesn't well, work in the context of a world where it's like, hey, yes it's silly in that like an alien group took over a city but it's not silly enough where you're teleporting and stuff right mm -hmm. but I, I think about the win formula guys I, I think what we really want what they need to give us is a free to play endless runner set on zen Perfect. where you're hopping from platform <laughs> it's to everything platform everything I've ever wanted with in-app purchases yep. uh, uh, for, for phones I think that's what Half-Life 3 confirmed right there I think I don't know we could never predict what Half-Life 3 will be because Valve is still figuring it out. And, and we can't is... even predict if, if Half-Life 3 will be. Yeah, <laughs> if it's being made. Yeah. Because to Dan's point, every Half-Life game has been radically different than any other entry in the genre. And it has always progressed. And I imagine that's what's been keeping it up, uh, is them trying to push the genre forward and reinvent stuff. That, and Valve hasn't made a single-player experience since 2009. Mm -hmm. that too. <laughs> they have no interest in it anymore. Everything is hardware and multiplayer and getting gigantic numbers of people playing a single product. And, and they're making play. gobs of money doing it. I mean, yes. I, I understand that, that at this point this is a, a risk-reward proposition for them. But uh, at the same time, it's it's kind of like, you know, I watched the presidential debate the other night, and I just wanted somebody beside, you know, somebody say something risky, please. Yeah. Uh, did and, you watch it in VR? Uh, no, no, I didn't. <laughs> you can do that. I did watch it with Moriarty, which yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> but it, uh, it you do want to see somebody uh, that people who took risks and made great things, you want them to take more risks. And I understand we'd all be screaming if the risk didn't work out. Uh, but I, I, I want them to do it anyway. I'd like to see something beautiful and innovative and compelling again for people I trust to produce something like that. Yeah, at this point, I wrote about this last year for the 10th anniversary of Half-Life 2. I wrote a thing about how Half-Life 3 doesn't really have a place at Valve anymore, like we were talking about. Um, but at the same time, I feel like it's one of those things that Valve almost owes the community. Like, it is their responsibility to finish what they started. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, that damn cliffhanger ending. Jesus yeah. Christ, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. I still, like, every time I think about it, I get mad at how good they are at storytelling. Mm -hmm. And then they just uh, decided to stop telling that story. Yeah. It's infuriating. I'm also, I maintain my biggest conspiracy theory is we will wake up one day and Dan is going to be dead from a heart attack because they will have just released Half Life. Oh, <laughs> like happens. you'll wake up and it'll be Ste you'll it'll open just, Steam yeah. and there it is. Yeah, that would be amazing. I, ho I hope that's what they do. That, that would literally I, kill Dan. Though. I hope that's what they do. They're 100 percent not doing that. That'd be amazing. <laughs> just, just amazing. But yeah, they really did just kind of leave us with Locke like looking into the hatch and the light coming on and then cutting to black. You know, yeah. it is that kind of. Cliffhanger. Just I, like, just, I, don't, I do not see a world in which whatever this game is is not something that is constantly being updated by a obsessive team that is constantly iterating on what it is. Yep. I'm yeah. telling you, free to play. Uh, uh, Damn it, runner, Jared. Set on Zen. Damn it, uh, Jared. I, I guarantee you, they've they've got a dozen different prototypes and thought like where they thought they yeah. had a great idea. That it's it's like ah, eh, it's good but not good enough. Yeah, they had a lot of that with Portal where they tried different stuff and mm -hmm. like that's pretty good. That works. Put it aside. I also remember. Remember, did you read Jeff Keeley's? Uh, he did that. Uh, what is his last days of? Or... Yeah, the final hours. Yeah, he did final hours of Portal Two. Yep. And there was something he wrote about where it's like the Valve had found like another really great gimmick, like the portal gun, like the bouncy gel, like the sliding gel, like that kind of thing, right? Like the, a way to interact with the environment with a character. Mm. And he was like, I he all right, so like I saw it. I can't talk about it, but it is part of whatever their next big thing is. I wonder if we ever saw that. 
Like, did they stick it in Dota 2 or did they throw it in a Team Fortress update? And we're just like, oh, <laughs> nobody ever thought about, like, the next big thing that Valve came up with. Mm-hmm. Just kept it in their pocket. Yeah. Right, I mean, or is that they're, still they're, banked in a prototype somewhere? They're just in, they're in a place where they, like, they've, they have their income is taken care of. They don't. Yep. They aren't in a situation where they have to release something. Yeah. So they get to sit back and wait until they have yeah, until they blow themselves away. Until they're like, oh my god, this is so good, we got to release it. Um, must be nice. Yeah. Yes, it must. Meanwhile, the rest of us are just just aching. Stuck playing something. all their other fine products. Huh? <laughs> Too bad there are no other games to play. Yeah, it's a real shame. <laughs> uh, I think that's all we got for this week, boys. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate um, it. Before we go, we do have a big special surprise, Jared. Uh, our own John Ryan at IGN gave us a giveaway pack oh. for our first ever IGN Overclocked giveaway. Whoa. Right here, we have a, uh, a handy-dandy Witcher 3 tote bag, but it's... inside is a, a boxed copy of an expansion pack, which I haven't seen for literally years. <laughs> uh, we have the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Hearts of Stone expansion pack uh, to give away here. Which Vince really likes. Yeah. He gave it a nine. Did he give the two packs of Gwent cards in this box a nine? I, Cause bet. That's, I bet he would give those a ten. He, he, would. he yeah, actually really likes really some Gwent. Gwent. He thinks yeah. Gwent's better than Hearthstone. Yeah, he loves I some love Gwent. that editorial he wrote. It's so good. Go read that <laughs> if you haven't seen it. Um, the hilarious thing is up top, it says, like, box contains Hearts of Stone download code. Yep. <laughs> Two Gwent decks. So it's this gigantic box for an expansion pack with a digital code in it. It's a box of cards. So we need to find out a way to give this away. Oh, wow. What do you, Anybody have any ideas off the top of your head? How I do think we it should involve harassing away? one of the editors who's not in this room with multiple something set to the Twitter account. I think that's that's definitely one way to do it. Ooh. Like, uh, you know, something something irritating sent to one of our friends. Hmm. I think that, what, that's definitely good. What stuff. does Marty oh, hate the no, most? No, no, no. So everyone, Vince Ingenito, <laughs> his Twitter handle is Vincognito, mm-hmm. V-I-N-C-O-G-N-E-A-T-O, right? Yep. Vincognito. Everybody, if you would like to be entered in this, using the hashtag overclocked so that I can track it, uh, tweet at Vince and just say, Gwent is better than Hearthstone. There we go. That's it. That's that it. is your entry to win. Gwent is better than Hearthstone, hashtag overclocked. Uh, we will select a winner at random. I'll DM you, try and get your address details so we can send this for you, send this out to you. So if you want a copy of Hearts of Stone and two Gwent decks, tweet events. Don't tell him what's going on. Just let him find out on his own. <laughs> at Vincognito. At Vincognito. Gwent is better than Hearthstone. Hashtag overclocked. And that's how we'll give this away in this fancy tote bag. Uh, total sidebar, we started a show last week called Esports Weekly with Coke. That just has a lot of connections with PC gamers in general. It's our esports show, Competitive Gaming. Uh, Kevin Naki hosts that for us. The first episode is about ESL 1, the Dota 2 tournament that happened a, a while back. Uh, he interviews uh, Snoopy, a League of Legends pro or ex pro, mm-hmm. and Charlie Yang from Evil Geniuses. That's every Friday at 4 p.m. The show is really 4 p.m. Pacific, that is. Uh, the show is incredible. The mm-hmm. production value is awesome. They have lots of really cool stuff planned. I am very excited about it personally. Because I care about them competitive vidgies. Esports, that's like Mario Tennis, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Mario Golf on Game Wii Boy. Esports, yeah. Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. Uh, finally, IGN Prime is something that we do here. Uh, it's weirdly, like, I, I saw it as somebody coming into IGN and was like, oh, I don't know, but what is this thing that IGN Prime is? It's weird, and it's the best. I love it because it's you get a free game every month. And sometimes the games are better than others. Most times they're actually really good. Uh, but the best thing is no ads in front of videos. It's mm. No ads on, on front of the videos, in front of anything. Yes. Yeah. So all the ads on the site. Splash ads are gone. Yeah, so it just makes it. looking at IGN like a much better experience. I get It's funny. I get really mad when IGN logs me out and yep. I go to watch a video and I'm an ad. I'm like, no! <laughs> I, like, I have to log back in and get my Prime thing, like register with the site so I don't have to watch ads ahead of videos because I just want to watch Destin do crazy stuff in Destiny. Did you see him throw that hammer? It's so it's good. Amazing. Holy <laughs> crap. Go find what was the video called? The, uh, the lucky, the, the luckiest, luckiest kill in kill, Destiny. Yeah, like that. So yeah. good. Oh, and we should also plug the uh, top 100 games. Oh yeah, that's oh, ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is Friday though. The, the, by the time you hear this, the top 100 games will all be revealed. Ooh, yeah. number one will be out there. Let's yeah. not we'll spoil it. There, the, yeah. the top 10 has a lot of PC games in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's gonna be. I, I like this list. I, I, I loved the process of putting this together. I but hated I it. Really <laughs> re- I hated the oh, process. I, I love it. the result. I love what yeah. came of it, and it's it was worth the effort. But man. It's all, sitting in a room with everybody and just screaming about like, no, Dota 2 should be number 50, not number 51. 
It's, it's just like, why am I here? <laughs> what is my purpose on this earth? It's always really interesting to take a, a big group of people like we have at IGN and have them all talk about what, what their favorite games are and what should be above what and what. Because uh, like, it, it's it's so many opinions mashed into one, it, it just results in a very interesting list. Right, like if the three of us sat down right now and we're like, what's the best game of all time? What's the number one game? Mm-hmm. We'd have like a really long, intense conversation about three different games. And it would multiply be that by 20 people. And have it five times. Jesus. And have the same conversation over five different meetings with all those yeah, people. It was, and it was with chaos. an elaborate spreadsheet. See, a spreadsheet with every good game ever listed on it, so you can't forget any of them. Yeah. And, oh, I, feel, I think that's how the framers of the Constitution felt. Like, it was by the end. Just like, you know what? Great compromise. Sure, whatever. How, sure, just sign how it. How Senate signed the thing. <laughs> it, was, it was so much fun. And I love our list. I, I really think it's a big, messy, wonderful, like, like catalyst for discussion. I think it's fun. All Ultimately, it's good. You know, these things, we, we care about them. We did our best. It's a bunch of subjective opinions that you're welcome to agree or disagree with, but it's a, a it's a cultural touchstone for engaging and discussing what we all love. And, and hey, that's why I like it. And hey, pick a game off there that you haven't played and try it. Yes. Absolutely. Go play new games. Uh, I'm at MitchyD on Twitter. You can follow me there and talk to me about stuff and make sure maybe you tag me in those hashtag overclock tweets to Vince. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Trying to think of stuff I've done lately. Oh, uh, go read my feature, uh, Players First. I, uh, it's EA's two-year trial by fire to make things better at, at EA. Uh, worked super hard on that with lots of executive interviews. We talked to Peter Moore and Andrew Wilson and Patrick Soderlund about EA trying to clean up its act in the last couple of years. Yeah. Dan, nice. At Dan Stapleton on Twitter, what are you working on lately? Um, working on my Rebel Galaxy review. I'm trying Still to get, get it together. Gonna, Ooh. I, I finally beat that last night. It just hit me that I think I called it Rogue Galaxy last week in the yeah. show notes, which is a PlayStation 2 JRPG. I need to sure. check that I got that right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I finally finished it last night. So, nice. So I'm writing my review Review today. coming soon. Yeah. Nice. Uh, should, should have it up, but well, hopefully by the time the show is up. Cool. Yep. I at like Petty it comma, At Petty Comma Jared. At Petty Comma Jared. C-O-M-M-A there in the middle. Yeah, uh-huh. which is a terribly... Uh, confusing Twitter handle, and I wish no, I, I like had it. Chosen. I think it's clever. And I'm working on a super secret project that uh, I don't even know what you're talking yeah, about. I know. Do I? I? Know it's super secret. No, I don't, I don't think, think I you do. do. So I get to, Ooh. and uh, hopefully, I'd like to do the rounds in the podcast maybe next week to push this because uh, we're gonna have something something new and fun. Might uh, might have something to do with with vaults and uh, and uh, that uh, that their post apocalyptic future. Oh, I uh, think I am. I'm so, picking up what you're putting yeah, down. Yeah. That's been the taking a lot up, of my time. I'm, I'm piecing things. together what you're talking about and some gossip I heard. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty excited All about right. that. But uh, right. I think we'll make the official announcement for that next week. Mm. Nice. Look forward to that. Uh, cool. Thank you guys for listening and joining us and you guys for co-hosting and talking about some pretty cool PC games, fact or fiction or otherwise, this week. Uh, we'll be back next week probably with Jared on Overclocked oh, Episode so 11. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you can talk about your announcement and hopefully some other PC Ooh, stuff you're playing. Yay. Uh, so we will talk to you then. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Dyer.